Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Yvonne Garcia, and I'm the chair of the Chamber's Women's Network Advisory Board. I'm also a senior vice president and chief of staff to the chairman and CEO of State Street and head of global communications. As we kick off the fall with a great lineup of virtual events, you know, we at the Women's Network remain more committed than ever to connect women across all industries and career levels, to strengthen your professional networks, and to engage you in the greater Boston business community. I'd like to take a moment and welcome anyone who's joining us for the first time. I know we also have a lot of new members on the board and really proud um, at the diversity that we've brought to the table, different perspectives. Um, representing different industries and backgrounds. Truly lucky to have a great group of leaders join us. I also encourage you to join an, in on today's discussion on social media using hashtag BossBizWomen and the at um, Boston Chamber. And then also, um, if you have questions during the panel, please enter your questions for our panelists in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens. Remember the program's recorded, um, so you'll be able to share it with your friends and we post it on our YouTube page afterwards. Today's topic is extremely important and one uh, that's uh, just of great importance here at State Street as well. You know, environmental, social, and governance, ESG investing is becoming the future of our finance industry as investors you know, are thinking more about the long-term impacts of their investments to ensure that their money is going to the organizations that are environmentally sound, socially responsible, and governance focused. Now, one of the proudest accomplishments at State Street has been the increased number of women on corporate boards as a result of our Fearless Girl campaign initiative in 2017. Most recently, we were, had the privilege of honoring the original Fearless Girl by putting a collar on the, our Fearless Girl in the honor of Justice Ginsburg. So today we have the opportunity to hear from some of the Northeast leaders who are paving the way when it comes to financing for good. And with that, I'd like to give a big thank you to our Women's Network sponsor who has made this possible, Liberty Mutual Insurance. We really appreciate their support and partnership to bring this content and platform to all of you today. Now I'd like to welcome Arlene Zelliot, Senior Vice President and General Attorney for Liberty Mutual Group, who will introduce today's speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. It's my pleasure to be here. At Liberty Mutual, we are committed to the advancement of women in our organization. We demonstrate that commitment in several significant ways through our expanded parental leave and flex time policies is one example, and also on a daily basis through the tireless efforts of our women's ERG, which we call We at Liberty, and of which I have the privilege to be the co-executive sponsor. The ERG offers a myriad of lectures networking events and mentorships to assist women in growing business and personal skills to build their own powerful brand. Additionally, Liberty is so proud of our Men as Allies initiative, which recognizes the key role our male colleagues play in women's advancement. During these unprecedented and uncertain times, one thing remains certain. That is the invaluable power of support networks, the coming together of the many to lift up individuals, to empower each of us to overcome any obstacles in our past. At Liberty, we believe that women supporting women joined by engaged male allies is vital for the well being, growth, and success of our employees, our company, and of our communities. On behalf of Liberty Mutual Insurance, it is my honor to introduce today's guest speakers. Our first panelist is Emily Chu, Global Head of Sustainability for Investment Management at Morgan Stanley. New to her role, Emily brings with her an abundance of knowledge around ESG research, program development, and capital markets, along with a wonderfully global perspective having worked in US, China, and Australia. Emily chairs Morgan Stanley's Investment Management Sustainability Council. She is also a member of the Principles for Responsible Investment Listed Equities Integration Subcommittee, and she chairs the Asian Investor Group on Climate Change. Next, 
I am pleased to introduce my friend and dear colleague, Francis Hyatt, Executive Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer at Liberty Mutual Insurance. Francis leads Liberty Mutual's environmental, social and governance, ESG initiatives across the global enterprise. As the first in his role, he was tasked with reinforcing the company's commitment to social responsibility, making environmentally conscious decisions and upholding the highest standards in corporate governance. Over the past 28 years, Francis has played a significant role in shaping various leadership and workforce strategies at Liberty. I would also like to introduce Marissa Sullivan, Vice President of ESG Equity Strategy at Bank of America. Marissa is based out of Bank of America's New York office and has a background in equity research and strategy. Well-versed in market data and analysis, Melissa offers a wonderful perspective to today's discussion. Last but not least, moderating today's panel discussion, we have Amber Fairbanks, Portfolio Manager, Manager at Marava. Amber works on the global equity team at Marava, a key player organization in the sustainability finance industry that provides its clients with investment solutions that aim to reconcile financial performance with positive environmental and social impact. She has over 10 years of experience in portfolio management and is a member of the Boston Security Analyst Society, BSAS. Thank you all for joining us today. I'll now turn it over to you, Amber. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you also to the Greater Chamber of Commerce as well as the Women's Network and obviously Liberty Mutual for holding this panel. And also thank you to our wonderful panelists today. I'm really looking forward to facilitating the discussion. So to start, you know, in the U.S., Marova has both a global and an international sustainable equity strategy, which I co-manage. But the firm has a much larger presence in Europe, where we've been integrating ESG into the investment process for over 30 years. So while Europe was a leader in adopting ESG analysis as a way to add value to the investment process, we're seeing strong growth now in the U.S. and other parts of the world. The down this being that every asset manager these days seems to be offering a solution to meet this demand. And there are many different approaches which can be confusing to an investor. So today we're gonna to learn from a panel of experts how they're looking at and integrating ESG. But let's start the discussion on a more personal note. So we've heard a little bit about everyone's backgrounds, but it would be interesting to hear from all of you, why are you in ESG investing and what led you to this? focus. Marissa, why don't we start with you? Sure. Yeah. And th thanks, Amber. And thanks, everybody, for joining today. And thanks to the Chamber and, and Liberty Mutual for putting this together. Um, you know, I'm, I'm newer to the world of, of ESG investing than some of our other panelists. But when uh, I had the opportunity to, to, to pivot into a more uh, sustainability and ESG focused role, I, I really jumped at it, you know, for, for a couple reasons. You know, first, just the universal importance of the issue. I mean, you, 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 you want to be able to work on something that, that has relevance both personally and, and that can impact you know, as many people as possible. And I think there's probably no better way uh, to do that, to be focused on issues like an, you know, environmental, you know, key environmental issues or social issues and, and govern, you know, good governance. So, so I think just you know, being involved in, in something that just affects as, you know, so many people is one thing. And then I just, I think the uh, ability to have impact at scale. Um, you know, I, I, we all, in addition to, to doing something we're passionate about, want to feel like we're actually having an impact and, and that um, the work that we're focused on really, you know, can have a you know, positive effect on, on those around us. And again, um, I think being able to, you know, be involved in, in uh, you know, doing that through the financial markets, which I think, you know, have, have a tremendous can be a tremendous force for good and, and channeling that towards um, environmental and, and social and governance considerations. I think it's just, it, it, it combines, uh, uh, you know, impact with, with cause. And, uh, and so that's, I think, you know, key focus for me. Thank you. Francis, do you want to try that question? Sure, thanks. <clears throat> really glad to be here today with such a, uh, an amazing group of uh, panelists. So my role is a little different. While I'm not directly responsible for the investment portfolio at Liberty, I'm, I'm responsible for building out the uh, ESG strategy and the environmental program. So whether you think about 
sustainable investing from a climate risk perspective, whether you think about sustainable investing from a governance or transparency, compliance and ethics, or candidly, whether you think about it in terms of really the S category and, 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 and uh, investing in uh, um, you know, funds or investing directly where it actually makes good from a societal perspective. Uh, my group ensures that we have good uh, ESG factors that are being built into the fiber of what we do from an investing perspective. We have a huge partnership with the uh, investment arm of Liberty Mutual. You know, insurance companies are not necessarily always thought of as being big investors in terms of looking at uh, some of our partners that are um, on the panel with, but the reality is for many uh, insurance companies like Liberty, we have, you know, 80 to $100 billion of investments under management that are directly managed by our folks internally. So it is a big deal. Um, for me personally, uh, I believe in whether it's the E, the S, or the G, I've been passionate about climate. Uh, many of the pillars uh, or the components within this, this social pillar of ESG, and certainly when it comes to governance or compliance and ethics, uh, you know, it's a big part of what we do at Liberty Mutual as a value-based company. And I've been there for so long, I have a hard time parsing out what's me or what's the company. Uh, so I think that would be the good start, Amber. Thanks. Thank you. Emily? Thanks, Amber. And it's a pleasure to be with you today. And thank you to the Chamber for hosting this event. Uh, so you asked, what's the personal motivation for being in this space? And very similar to my co-panelists, it's really about being able to blend personal conviction and purpose with what you do every day. Uh, I think I always wanted to be working in a field where what I was doing was constructive and, and something that I felt was anchored in a vision of the future uh, that I could personally get behind. And I think I've been very lucky and privileged to be able to carve out a, a career path in this space. And I think what's kind of made it gratifying or satisfying is not only that uh, broader purpose component, the fact that obviously climate and diversity and these topics are extremely pertinent and relevant to what I see in the world. It's also just intellectually extremely interesting. Like there's always something new to learn. There's never a dull day. There's always a new paper to read, a new trend to watch. And so I think it's really just about that combination of you know, broader vision, anchoring your individual work life in, in, part, in part of a broader vision of, of where the world should or could be, as well as that uh, intellectual engagement. Thank you for that. Um, so moving on, you know, when I first started working in sustainable investing in 2007, before it was trendy, it was known as socially responsible investing, and ESG was just not an acronym that you heard. So now ESG is to be heard everywhere, but within the industry, there seems to be lack really of standardization and terminology with ESG investing and sustainable investing and impact investing really almost being used interchangeably, which can be certainly confusing investor. So can you explain the difference in these terms and your thoughts, if you have any, on why there is this lack of standardization? Um, Francis, maybe you could start. Uh, so part of it is, I think, alignment and evolution, uh, Amber, I'm happy to start. I think, um, so the difference in the terms, I'll start with, uh, with uh, let's see, we have something popping up in front of me. I will close. Uh, I don't know if my colleagues are seeing the same thing, but um, when I use the term evolution, I think what's happened is back in back as you were talking about when you first started out, uh, Amber, uh, really the focus may have been uh, more narrow in terms of either public opinion or stakeholder or shareholder. And for our, for our purposes, Liberty being a mutual, we don't deal, deal with the uh, public markets, but um, shareholder pressure has certainly broadened the view of what companies need to care about. And so from my perspective, when we think about ESG and we think about the world of sustainable investing, which is the term that I choose to use, um, it's really in terms of response to the market and the breadth and the diversity of issues that are coming up that either investment management firms, banks, insurers, or other financial institutions have to care about. So for example, maybe uh, 10, 15 years ago, the issues associated with transparency and compliance and um, uh, disclosure from a financial perspective may have been hot. But as we continue to evolve and issues associated in the social pillar, whether it's in regard to gender equity, race equity, whether pay equity, parity, companies' positions on these 
need to be clear and candidly are very, very important to the investor community. And so as, as the world has evolved, the investor and the investor community has evolved. And so I guess that will be where I stop and I'll let my, uh, my co-panelists jump in from that. Maybe we'll play tag in terms of answers at this point. Emily, I see you smiling, so maybe you can jump in next. No, I just totally uh, agree with everything that you've said um, to try to add to that. I think, um, I think we should all take a step back and not get too fixated on what term refers to what specific behavior. The reality is it's a new and emerging field. And one of the struggles and frustrations of working in sustainable investing, I, I totally agree, Francis, I tend to refer to the field more broadly as sustainable investing, but other people will call it ESG investing, responsible investing, whatever. Whatever it's called, ultimately, it's about the interface between capital markets and the broader physical social reality in which capital markets operate. And some a segment of the, of the market is extremely concerned with how do the dynamics that are happening in the physical and social environment, political environment, affect companies? And how do our current accounting metrics fall short in understanding and being able to model how those forces are going to impact the company's competitiveness, its risk management, its profitability. So there's that kind of outward looking into the company element. But there's equally a certain segment of the market, and I would say a growing voice, which is also saying we need to be conscious and intentional about how the corporate sector or about how investing activities affect our, our physical and social reality. And how do we measure that? And what's the role of shareholders and boards and, and uh, CEOs in actually managing those potentially positive or negative impacts. And so really the whole field is grappling with what's the terminology, what are the measurements, how do we conceptualize both the, the flow of influence both ways. So, I mean, I, broadly speaking, I would say responsible investment tends to be a term used a little bit more frequently in, in Europe. It has a tinge of the, the values based, so excluding companies based on certain values that you as an investor may hold, whether those are ethical, religious, or related to your constituents. Broadly speaking, ESG integration is this concept of looking out into the market, trying to understand, well, what's the material exposure of the company to carbon pricing or to human capital turnover or to supply chain uh, disruption? because of ESG factors and how do I model that, measure that, uh, track it. Uh, and then broadly impact investing, I would say is about this idea of not only investing to make money, but investing in order to, to make measurable, positive environmental and social impact. So I would say those are the broad flavors, but um, obviously these terms are used interchangeably. And I think we should try to not get too frustrated with the fact that these terms are used interchangeably and just look under the hood like, what is the fund manager selling you? What is the company trying to convey to you? What, what is the, um, you know, what are your intentions and what are your priorities as an investor in order to navigate the space? Marissa. Um, yeah, I, I was, I think, I think you summarized it beautifully. I think the only thing I would um, just add or, or put a finer point on just from our perspective is that, you know, I think we have seen this evolution from, you know, a socially responsible investing or more of a narrow landscape focused on excluding, um, you know, excluding, excluding um, companies or, or securities that, that have a particular, you know, um, social or ethical lens. So excluding, you know, investments in alcohol companies or, or tobacco companies. It seems to be, you know, as, as investors are getting more sophisticated about it, as the concepts are broadening out, um, you're seeing a, a move towards more positive screening. So, you know, uh, sustainable investing is not just about excluding the bad actors, but but finding and really supporting and investing those who who really are, um, you know, pioneering, uh, you know, sustainable initiatives. Um, and then I also think you're seeing it become, at least from the investors that we speak to, I think this is, you know, our perspective is that it's going to become less of a separate thing. But over time, as, as Emily, you were talking about, it's going to become more integrated. So there won't be, you know, in a perfect world, there's not ESG investors and and, you know, regular investors or non-ESG investors, it's, it's all fused and integrated where in, in, you know, in, in thinking about risks and, and opportunities in, in a company, you're considering you know, not just traditional financial uh, measures and metrics, but, but some of these other you know, non-financial measures as they relate to in, environmental impacts or, or you know, social um, or governance factors. So um, 
we kind of, I think part of the reason why there's more terms is because it's broadening out um, and it's becoming just more integrated in a lot of what investors are doing uh, in a, on a daily basis. And Amber, maybe one thing to close out on that would just piggyback on what Marissa and uh, Emily just said is that I think also part of that evolution of why the language is changing is that um, years ago, I believe it would have been viewed as much more black and white in terms of uh, decisions that were made, whereas the decisions that have to be made from a sustainable investing, at least from my perspective and how we're looking at it, are more nuanced because there's a journey that organizations are on relative to climate, relative to, to positions that they're changing. So I'm going to use an example that's fairly well known in the news. If you look at Philip Morris, for example, and this is not a Liberty Mutual example, I just happened to notice it in regard to corporate purpose. PMI has made the decision that they're moving to a uh, smoke-free, they're not going to produce cigarettes anymore. They're only going to be providing nicotine. Now, whether you agree or disagree with nicotine-based products, they're trying to move away from carcinogen-based um, products, and their CEO is trying to change the shape of their organization. For investors that are considering PMI as somebody that they may want to put uh, their assets into, they need to be considering a journey-based approach with PMI because they're not turning a switch in day one. This is not a paid political announcement for them. I want to be very clear. I'm using an egregious example on purpose because it's, it's a good example of something that there is no switch. Fossil fuels are another great example, right? We have many examples where we look at fossil fuel companies that we might um, on the face of them say, we don't really want to invest in them today because the nature of what they're doing is very coal intensive. However, they're making a commitment to renewables in the future, and maybe we want to stand by them for the long-term view of where they're going. So I think that's why for us, we're viewing it much broader in terms of the definition and looking at it in terms of sustainability as opposed to a very narrow definition that may have been viewed in years past. We're not hearing. Amber, we're having some trouble hearing you. Is that better? No. Yes. Yeah, you can hear me? Okay. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Sorry. I, my, my computer crashed and I wasn't sure if I had audio again. Um, so moving on. So we've seen really tremendous growth into flows in ESG investing over the last several years globally. So what do you believe is driving this growth? In other words, you know, why is ESG so great? Do you expect this is a long-term trend or just a short-term market trend? Some rest. Do you start with that one? Yeah, sure. Um, Thank you. You know, in terms of what's driving it, I, I think you know, aside from just I think a growing interest among uh, in investors in in these issues, and, and we could talk about that. Um, separately or in a, in a moment. I, I think there's a growing body of evidence that this that uh, incorporating, you know, sustainability factors or ESG factors actually works. And what, I'm, what do I mean by work? I, I think that, you know, we've seen in, in our research that uh, incorporating ESG uh, can, can help uh, from a risk management standpoint and, and mitigate uh, the risk of an, an investment. Um, you know, for example, we, we did a quantitative analysis that compared, um, you know, ESG measures as, as a predictor of, of earnings risk to some of the other more traditional measures like like leverage or debt to equity and we actually found ESG was one of the most consistent predictors of a, a future earnings risk um, even more so than some of those other traditional measures so I think from a risk management standpoint um, it, it, it ESG is a, is a, a very important uh, tool for investors to use uh, we've also found on, on the opposite side of the coin um, some evidence that uh, ESG can also enhance returns and so as, as we look at um, you know the performance of highly rated ES you know companies that are highly rated on ESG or funds that are that are, are ESG funds, uh, we have seen uh, evidence that um, you know those that are highly rated on, on ESG tend to outperform their peers. Um, you know we, we can talk about some other reasons as, as to why, but but we we do see that that trend um, in the market, and we actually interestingly saw it. Um, you know the performance was quite notable notable earlier this year with the with the you know the. the uh, Fair market that we experienced, um, we saw that uh, companies that were highly ranked on ESG outperformed uh, their uh, their competitors from a from a stock performance standpoint, and they had more stable earnings. Their or their earnings cuts were were smaller. So again, I, that really drove the point home that that there really is something around, uh, you know, from a from a from a results standpoint that that incorporating 
ESG factors into an investment process um, can, can have an impact, uh, not just from a risk standpoint, but from a return standpoint as well. And I, and I think that that's quite attractive to, uh, to uh, investors and, and their clients. Thank you. Emily? Uh, yeah, to reiterate, um, we have a piece that just came out, I think it was last week. Uh, it's, we have a, a survey that we do annually called the Sustainable Signals Survey produced by the Morgan Stanley Institute for Sustainable Investing. And to underline the point that Mar Marissa made, if we look just at US equity funds, and I think it's important to, to, to note that I think the cynicism around whether ESG is a fad and whether you're gonna lose money by you know, investing in good companies, that has actually tended to be more of a, a view held more broadly in the US than it has in Europe, I would say. But if you actually, uh, what our sustainable signal survey showed is that US equity funds in 2019 that were traditional versus the ones that were sustainable, it was the sustainable funds that actually had a median return that was 2.8% higher than the traditional funds. And this is based on a survey of about 1,100 um, US domiciled mutual funds and ETFs. And then we just updated it uh, for the H1 2020 figures last week. And the outperformance of the sustainable funds as a category versus traditional is now at 3.9. So it's actually, as Marissa indicated, gone up. Now we, we need to qualify all these results and say, obviously we need to see several market cycles. We need to see uh, better definitions of how funds are categorized in order to really remove any noise from this data. But I think really the confidence is now there that we're not, it's not about giving up returns in order to do good. It's really about long-term uh, strategic management. It's about business resilience. It's about navigating an increasingly comp complex world. And that's what ESG investing is helping fund managers actually navigate. And I think beyond that, uh, beyond the kind of increased demand and social awareness among investors and beyond the, the data being there, I think the infrastructure within the fina finance industry has also strengthened. So we now have financial, an army of financial advisors in the industry that can actually speak intelligently to clients about this category, whereas even five years ago, many advisors were actually uh, tossing that out and, and advising their clients, oh, don't go there, you'll lose money, you'll lose returns, you don't want that in your portfolio. Uh, we're seeing increasing, a, a lot of sophistication from institutional investors really ratchet up as well. They're really digging in to the fund managers and, 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 and really asking tough questions now. It's really going beyond, oh, we have an ESG policy on our website, uh, or we have one ESG dedicated analyst who sits in the corner. Like they really, you can't really compete as an institutional investor these days without a lot of rigor in your process. And I think the benefit is in the retail um, investment market that all of the rigor that's coming from the institutional space is filtering through to how funds are managed in, in retail platforms. I think that's a great point. If I could just, I, the other piece of it is you're, you're, you're also seeing um, corporates really, I think, embrace ESG and, and disclose more around their own ESG programs. So, um, you know, ESG investors can't, can't do much unless they have data to, to analyze. And I think that that's the other thing, Emily, as you mentioned, you're seeing um, data on uh, sustainability initiatives or sustainability data uh, information grow exponentially, both from the companies and, and from new uh, data providers in the market. So it's, it's, it's uh, kind of a combination, I think, of all these factors that, that's come together to really make this a, a, a pivotal moment uh, for sustainability uh, investing. Thank you. Francis, did you want to add anything to the conversation? Yeah, uh, my, my perspective... I wouldn't add to theirs and simply because it would be redundant, but I just think uh, as the other factor to this is at the retail side, and we see it from the employee perspective, there's a bottom up push happening from an individual investor perspective, which, which whether folks are actually educated enough from the perspectives that Emily and uh, Marissa just shared or not, they're educated enough regarding what the societal issues are to know that what they want to invest in needs to be um, responsible. And so I see that as also a uh, push in the market from a retail perspective. I don't know how persuasive that is or pervasive that is in terms of how that impacts institutional or, uh, you know, commercial investors, but um, we definitely are seeing more and more feedback at the uh, retail level. And I think it's just an important factor that needs to be, uh, be discussed. 
Thank you. Um, so have we seen notable differences in adoption in ESG in different regions of the world? Emily, I know you have worked in both Boston and Hong Kong, studied in England and Australia, but I'm quite jealous of all of that. Um, but perhaps you could start out with answering this question. Sure, and I think um, there's increasing convergence globally as well um, in, broad, in broad terms, but, but with nuances. So um, I would say uh, as a whole, the adoption of ESG metrics and sustainability as an investment thesis and factor is a global trend. The PRI and the CFA actually have done a really interesting um, multi-regional, multi-part uh, report series on this in 2018 to 2019, where they actually looked at the ESG integration practices in North America, Asia, and Europe, uh, and highlighted you know, some, some differences, but, but I think the common trend is that it's all just more of everything. Um, I think in Asia, you see, tend to see, um, on the one hand, uh, fund management culture or the, the equities markets being very short, even more short term in, in their behavior uh, than, than in other parts of the world. Um, uh, and that, you know, there's this kind of historical, you know, growth, you know, it's the, in, in fast growing markets, you tend to see that kind of behavior a little bit more. So you, you tend to see short termism, termism more pervasively among the portfolio management culture. And yet I think you see governments working much more collaboratively with stock exchanges and securities uh, regulators <clears throat> to coordinate around setting that floor around sustainability disclosures, um, investor behavior, <clears throat> much more proactively than we have seen in the US, for example, where I think philosophically there's much more of a bent towards the market will, you know, the market will take care of things. Um, I think in Europe also you're seeing particularly with the establishment of the EU Sustainable Finance Commission. They've introduced a whole package of regulation, which is multi-pronged. It's going to affect company disclosures, the issuance of green bonds and the, the definition of those bonds, um, uh, investor disclosures and categorization of funds, the establishment of, of new types of performance benchmarks that are more aligned with the Paris Agreement and with climate. You have a multi-pronged, very, very um, rapid and strong regulatory push in Europe that is going to have global reverberations. Uh, but basically to touch anything in Europe as a, as a provider of fund services, um, if, or if you're based in Europe, you will be caught by all of these regulations. So that's kind of coming online for us March next year. Um, so that's a huge push. And then I suppose what we're seeing in the US is a little bit of a, I think overall among the actual asset management community, a very similar trend to the rest of the world. But I think the regulators in, in recent times have been uh, kind of diverging a little bit from where Europe is going. Um, and that could cause some challenges, operating challenges, I think for global firms that are having to deal with proxy voting in a different way or having to deal with their ESG integration and their disclosures in a different way for different jurisdictions. So I, I don't want to take up too much time, but it's a, it's a um, you know, fascinating area um, to just kind of notice the regional differences and flavors. Great. Um, Francis and Marissa, I don't know if you guys have anything you'd like to add. If not, we can certainly move on. I thought that was a great overview. I know there's a lot of other questions, so. Yeah, sure. Um, so maybe shifting gears a little bit, you know, as many know, finance and industrial investment management is really a, typically a male dominated industry. And I'm often one of a handful of women in a room of several hundred people um, at any given investment conference. So, so Marissa and Emily, can you describe your experience as a female leader in this space? And have you seen the opportunity to create opportunities for other for both your investment strategy and your approach? Sure, um, I, I'm happy to start and then Emily, feel free to to chime in. Um, yeah, I've had a similar experience, Amber, of, of being um, one of the uh, few women in the room. Uh, what, what, what I've tried to do and, and, and you know, our, our team has tried to do is, is try to um, make the, put, you know, put the argument in familiar terms around, you know, the, the benefits, uh, you know, the, the you know, um, quantifiable benefits of diversity. And so we've done a lot of work uh, looking at, um, you know, for example, companies that have more diverse boards and uh, more diverse management teams, we have seen evidence that they tend to have higher returns on equity and, and lower uh, earnings risk. So 
you know, it, it, in fact, um, you know, we, we found that that relationship has held true for the last 10 years for S&P 500 companies uh, that have uh, at least a quarter of their, their boards are, uh, um, or their executives are women and, and, and more women on their boards. So, you know, when, when you put it in those terms, you know, would you like, you know, you know, do you want your company to have uh, better financial performance? Well, you tend to see that with more diverse teams, and that includes gender diversity in the boardroom and gender diversity in the C-suite. Um, I think that's a pretty compelling argument and, and one that's hard to, um, you know, pull holes in or, or hard to argue against. Um, you know, so that's kind of from a, from a um, you know, number standpoint. I, I think just in, in practice, it's, it's about building, a, you know, getting a more diverse, um, you know, gender diverse or, or um, you know, ethnic or racial diversity comes from just encouraging a, a more inclusive culture. Really, you know, I found it's, it, it's about, you know, kind of getting a recruiting pipeline going because you, how can you expect to have really capable um, senior leaders if, if you don't have really capable, um, you know, junior leaders and, and you know, the, the leaders of tomorrow. So I've tried to do a lot more work around, rec you know, recruiting and, um, you know, encouraging, um, college students or, um, you know, uh, others who are thinking about careers in finance um, to, you know, to um, dabble in the industry, you know, it can be a little bit intimidating, I think, to, to break in for some. And, and I actually was a career changer myself. I, I started in a, a international uh, policy. So, you know, having broken in and, and made that transition, um, you know, it's something that I, I, I really uh, want to encourage others who are interested to do because, it, you know, we need to start thinking about who are the, who are the leaders of, of tomorrow. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Emily, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, I mean, I think we all have our own stories and own kind of moments that we've kind of celebrated or struggled with <laughs> over the years. But I, I think that there hasn't really been a, a very, um, scientific study done on this yet. Uh, I, I have seen some journalists cover this, trend, but I think anecdotally, we, we are seeing more, um, as, as the, the field of sustainable investing has grown rapidly, particularly in the last five years, and as large mainstream institutions have tried to build out their teams and their leadership, we have seen, I think, women, for whatever reason, start to rise up to those uh, leadership positions, perhaps a bit more rapidly than in other traditional functions. And I think perhaps you know, I would say just anecdotally in my own hiring, in, um, in terms of the pools of candidates that I see, in terms of the um, teams that I've built, there's been, I think, a very strong pipeline of women showing a lot of interest in this area. Um, and that may be that, you know, women were just more populous in this particular field before it became really, really big uh, for the mainstream. And, and so as the mainstream is now fighting for talent and looking for people that have kind of this a long history or an awareness or the skills that have gone through the data, understand the different, different terminologies, et cetera. They're picking from a pool that's already very rich, I suppose, in, in kind of very senior female talent. That could be one reason, but I think it's a bit speculative uh, to really know because we need to kind of perhaps do a study on it to figure out why. Thank you. So maybe one last question for Francis, and then we can certainly open it up. I know there's a couple of questions in the queue from the audience. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Francis, you played a key role in really leading the charge in hiring Rachel's first chief diversity and inclusion officer. Can you talk about that strategic initiative? Sure. Thanks, uh, Amber. <clears throat> uh, and really, it's uh, a good follow up to what we just talked about in terms of, uh, you know, um, the, the issue around bringing women into more senior roles, but also all folks of difference. Um, if I, Liberty, but all companies have been on the journey to really uh, embrace difference and to understand difference top to bottom, whether it's starting at the board and diversifying their boards, uh, senior management team, C-suites all the way down. And at Liberty, um, we have a lot, you know, typical uh, long history in an insurance industry, previously very dominated by white men, and we needed to disrupt bias cand candidly. It was about coming in and creating an opportunity for us to do uh, a bit of a sharp pivot and bring someone into the organization that was gonna help us do a whole host of things. One was um, build muscle mass in learning how to deal with difference because what we know from the research is that 
by building out, it's not just about uh, talking about the issues, it's about creating meaningful experiences for our leaders uh, and our managers so that they are prepared to deal with difference in the organization. So that was the first thing. We had a burning platform to do that. The second is that um, race in the workplace is an important issue for us. We operate in many cities in the United States, but around the world where race is an issue or gender is an issue, um, depending on where we are. And we want to make sure that we are talking about it and that we have a um, systematic approach to dealing with difference and dealing with important issues about bias. And then lastly, um, our company is a values-based company. You know, a lot of organizations say that, but for us, um, we believe it's true. We don't think it's marketing speak. We kind of live our values daily. They're part of our meetings. They're part of how we engage with one another. And it should be part and parcel of the, the diversity and inclusion journey. And we needed a senior leader over DNI to make sure that we were driving all the right messages in that space. And then the third piece that I didn't mention is men, especially in financial services, and, and uh, Marissa and Emily mentioned, you know, the, the uh, experience they had as women, men have traditionally been in the senior positions. And how we educate men about being allies and being part of the solution for how women become uh, uh, more seen and more visible in more senior roles, how people of color advance uh, in their careers, um, how all members of uh, that represent difference, whether it's veterans or LGBTQ or the differently abled community, um, the white male community is filled with opportunity to disrupt their own bias and then become part of the solution. And so the third strategic piece of what our head of DNI has done has been really create an opportunity to make white men part of the solution as opposed to the finger pointing aspect of you're part of the problem. Not easy, it was very challenging, it took a lot of time. We're not there, it's a journey, but really those are the three big areas that we focused on and, um, and we will be working at it for a long time. Um, like many other organizations, we are wildly imperfect, but we are earnestly trying to get better at it. Thank you for that. Um, so there's already a couple questions in our Q&A. If you do have a question, just click on that Q&A function on the bottom and just type in your question. So to start, how would you recommend entering this space or pivoting to it if you're coming from a financial services background, asset servicing, relationship management, new business development with institutional investors, and a passion for sustainability, social climate justice, met through involvement on nonprofit boards, social justice organizations? So how would you pivot from sort of a traditional finance background into ESG? Anyone want to start? offer a couple of thoughts. Uh, I mean, I think um, one of the perhaps the frustrating aspects of this of this space is that there aren't it's not like there's clear pathways, I would say, there's uh, a lot more you can do now today than say 10 years ago to actually systematically build a skill set. Uh, the UK CFA, for example, has just launched a really valuable uh, ESG integration course. Um, the PRI offers training courses. Uh, there's a European certificate um, of security, I think it's the, the Society for Securities Analysts um, that you can do. Um, so, and then there's Cambridge, Oxford, I mean, they're offering kind of more formal training in this space. So I think getting some kind of qualification under your belt is much easier now than before, and they're more worthwhile, these training courses. And then I think it's really about um, whatever institution you're in, I would actually initiate the conversation with your existing institution about what are we doing? What is our sustainable investing strategy? So if you're, um, if you're a wealth platform, you need to have a strategy. You need to have advisors who are trained. You need to have a product offering platform. You need to have a client engagement strategy. Um, if you're an investment manager, you need to have a, an ESG research team. You need to have a stewardship function. So uh, what, whatever kind of section you're of the industry you're in, it may well be your existing institution needs a champion or needs a leader or needs someone to kind of ask those questions in order to start going down the path of building their own function out. Um, and you could be that person you know, because you know the institution because you're already on the inside. Um, There's just a couple of thoughts, but we all come to 
come to it from many different uh, angles. Um, Marissa or Francis, do you have advice? I think that's a great point because um, this is a this is a field that's really growing, and and I think more institutions and organizations are adding, um, you know, personnel and 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 resources to this. Um, what you suggest to, to, to kind of engage your own organization and, and share your interests, I think is a huge piece of it because um, nobody will expect to, to know that you're interested in it if you don't, if you don't make that clear. Um, and I think that's a, that's a great way to, to try to pivot in, in an organization where you are that proven entity that that was actually my experience. Um, I was a fundamental equity analyst. And then when uh, in our department, we were looking to expand our ESG research team. Um, I, I was, uh, and, and there was a, uh, I had uh, expressed, and you know, these were in, uh, areas that were interesting to me. Um, I uh, was um, approached with this opportunity, so so I think that's, you know, don't underestimate, um, you know, even within your own organization, um, the ability to make a pivot. But I think, like like anything, it's all about, um, you know, uh, the network that you build. And I think that the exciting thing about this space is there really is a, you know, I think because those who are involved in sustainability investing are, are kind of passionate people and and are really interested there's there's um you know it's, it's a great community already and, and i would say it's it's you know like anything it's about networking and and just you know doing due diligence and getting to know what are the different um paths out there that other people have taken um and because you never know when an opportunity is going to present itself so i think you just have to um you know start building a network building that you know networking and building within the the uh community and then um you know, opportunities may, may present themselves, but um, you know, it's, it, it definitely takes, takes some, some hustle and some, and some, and some hard work uh, throughout the process. That's, that's certainly what I found. I think the only thing I might add to that is um, I, I never uh, want to forget sponsorship in organizations. And if individuals who are looking to make a shift like Marissa or Emily were talking about can identify an individual that has the heft in the organization to sponsor them for a significant shift like this generally and the person is credible and has the influence in the organization it's going to position you uh, to be more successful in a transition I mean there uh, at Liberty we actually have a sponsorship program for women and people of color specifically to address issues like this because we're complex, we're big, we're diverse, we're geographically dispersed, and it's hard for people to make shifts like this. So sponsorship is a really, really important component. Great, thank you. Um, so for all the panelists, how difficult is it for seasoned investors to shift their mindset to fully integrate sustainability into their investments? Really, what are the specific challenges and how do they overcome them? Anyone start with that? I can, I can maybe have a go uh, at this one. Sure. Um, uh, how difficult is it? Well, it depends on, on the person. So <laughs> I, I, I feel like I should uh, at some point maybe do some kind of behavioral psychology uh, degree or something like that <laughs> to help me process my own experience in this field because I think, um, you know, they're, they're, people are motivated by different things. And, and, and even though portfolio management theory, I think is very well developed and valuation models are, are kind of very developed. I think what we're ultimately talking about here is a fundamental shift in how we think about valuations, how we think about portfolio construction and how we think about the capital markets. And that, that's pretty big. And, and most people are not really, I think, trained to kind of look at such a big kind of fundamental definitional shift break it down into the individual things they need to do on a daily basis. So for some people, it's, um, it's, it's for some people, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to move out of the functional fixation of I've been doing this for 20, 30 years. It's served me very well. I have no interest to, to move, right? Or I don't see the need to move. I, I literally cannot see the relevance of the factors. So that, that those people definitely exist in the industry. Uh, for other people, it's, it, they're really motivated by responsiveness to clients. And if clients are asking you tough questions, they will say, I need to, I need to bring my A game to every client meeting. And, and if they care about it, I have to care about it. So you have very client oriented people um, who are motivated extrinsically, um, but it's still an extrinsic motivation, but it's a motivation, right? To be better at serving your clients. And when you overwhelmingly hear this question from clients, you have to have a good answer. Um, and then, you know, some people are just personally 
holistic thinkers can see, you know, the inevitability of some of these trends that we're talking about. I mean, earlier this morning, it's Climate Week, and we hosted a, a discussion with Mary Shapiro, um, uh, talking about her experience of becoming ultimately a, a climate advocate by almost by accident, because she was doing the analysis and said, this is clearly going to affect the capital markets. So my institution needs to do something about this. Um, it was a very kind of logical, um, uh, data-driven decision for her, but then for other people, it's it's just that personal kind of uh, uh, link with the future. You know, I've got children, or I want to leave something behind that's like better than how I than how I found it. So people are motivated by different things, and it's really the the motivation that I find drives the behavior. Uh, <laughs> and ultimately, to me, it doesn't really matter whatever whatever the motivation is, as long as we all get there in the end. I'm just focused on trying to uh, you know support my colleagues to get there in the end. Yeah. What, what I would add is, as I engage with um, my uh, fundamental equity analyst colleagues is, is to, you know, well, do you, in your process, do you consider, um, you know, management in, incentives and compensation and how well they are aligned? Okay, well, you care about ESG. Do you, you know, you're already, you're already looking at that. Do you think about how, um, you know, environmental practices might, might, could, could lead to costly uh, legal action. You know, is, are there liability, is there liability risk there? Okay, well, you're, that's, that's an ESG consideration as well. Um, you know, do you think about uh, how the company structures its policies to retain talent? Well, that's an ESG consideration. So I, 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 I like to, um, you know, ca call out the ways in which um, some of my colleagues may already be thinking about ESG issues. They just didn't, um, you know, it was just so ingrained in their own process, they didn't separate the two. Because I, because I think, you know, over time, they're, they're not, you know, they're becoming inseparable. Um, and, and I think you can see that with the headlines of, you know, wildfires and, and you know, climate risk from a physical risk standpoint. I mean, there's, there's um, you know, many, I think it's hard to find a company that, that wouldn't be impacted by, by you know, environmental or, or, or social, um, you know, consideration. So I, I think, uh, you know, more, there are more ESG investors out there than, than we think. They just maybe don't, don't realize it yet. Um. I think that's a great point, Marissa. I, I was going to use the term demystifying ESG when it comes to building uh, muscle mass and, and building out sustainability factors, because the examples that you gave have been our experience, albeit that we are internally focused helping our investment teams build out their muscle mass and figuring out what are the ESG factors that they should be considering in different segments of the portfolios. Once we start the dialogue, the light bulb starts going off with them saying, well, we've been doing this for a long time. We're just calling it something different now. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna become more formalized and systematic about it towards a very, very specific goal. And I think that, um, becomes part of the process and, and the journey that people will be on in making that pivot. Great, thank you. So I think we have time for one final question. Um, so what questions should our audience as representatives of Boston's business community be asking to ensure that they're investing sustainably? I'm sorry, Abby, Anyone could you- want to start that? Could you sure. Just yeah, what question should our audience, as representatives of Boston's business community, be asking themselves to ensure that they're investing sustainably? And we're talking about their individual investments, or are we talking about their their investments as uh, in their in their business? Either or. Maybe I'll just start with with a, a quick thought. I, I think it's um, you know, it's, it's hard to know where you're going if you don't know where you are right now. And so I, you know, I think one place to start perhaps is just at whether you're, um, you know, on the corporate side or on the investment side, just, just you know, take a temperature check of, of, of how you measure up on ESG factors as it stands. You know, you, you, um, what is the, um, you know, diversity uh, breakdown of your organization? What are your, you know, can you assess your climate, you know, uh, if, if you're going to create climate goals, you have to kind of understand what your current footprint is. So, you know, I think just um, trying to um, find and, and understand, uh, you know, how your organization stacks up right now on ESG factors, I think is, is kind of the, the, the starting point for, for where you might, you know, be looking to go. So maybe uh, just start start with the data, I guess would be my suggestion. 
Um, yeah, I think that's excellent for, for corporate members, you know, doing essentially a, a sustainability strategic review. Um, is a, I agree with Marissa. I think as individuals, uh, if I think about, you know, us as individuals with our own 401ks and, and our own discretionary investment funds, I think we can be engaging our own wealth advisors on this topic. Uh, not taking no as, as an answer from the wealth advisor if they say, oh, you know, you're going to lose money. You can say, no, I've got the, I've got the sustainable signal survey. I saw it was posted in the chat box that says, you know, mutual funds actually aren't underperforming and potentially could outperform. So we need to change that conversation. So engage with your wealth provider, engage with your own employer about the retirement options on your, you know, what, uh, what's available to you. Um, you know, maybe even help your employer engage with the, the Fidelity or the Morgan Stanley or the John Hancock around how they can help make those options more um, either available or more visible uh, on, on the 401k platform. Francis, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add. I won't, I I'm almost out of time. So. Yeah, I'm all set, uh, Amber. They, uh, Emily and Marissa did a great job. Thank you. They did. Well, thank you all. Um, I will now hand it back over to our moderator, but this has been a great discussion, and I apologize. I think that is my cue. Uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining us today, and thank you especially to you, Amber, for the un, uh, enviable task of moderating. It's probably always the hardest part of this, so thank you. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, and thank you again to our sponsor, Liberty Mutual Insurance, for supporting our entire series of women's network programming. Um, next week, just a few talking points. Uh, we have Mayor Walsh coming up to give his annual address to the business community on Tuesday. Um, our next women's network event after that is on October 15th, where we'll hear from the brand new president of Simmons University. Um, and finally, by October 14th, we hope you'll submit your nominations for our annual Pinnacle Awards. These awards every January honor eight top women in business um, and is always probably one of our most popular gatherings here at the chamber. So please nominate multiple women for these awards. Uh, and with that, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Emily, Francis, Amber, and Marissa again, and we're logging off. Thank you. <laughs>